Okay, 11.21, I guess we can get started. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining our talk today. Uh, my name is Andrew Weiss. Uh, I'm the lead architect working with uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, in partnership with SoftRed. Uh, and I want to introduce you to uh, Bruno as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Bruno Avalam, a research scientist at Intel Labs. Awesome. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, so today, of course, we want to talk about how uh, we're uh, bringing trust and privacy preserving smart contracts to clinical trials uh, in healthcare. We'll just jump right into it. Bruno, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so clinical trials today really are, the are critical to the success of new treatments uh, for novel vaccines, drugs, medical devices, uh, and many more. Uh, many of you may be familiar with clinical trials as they pertain to discovery of new vaccines related to COVID-19 over the pandemic in the last year. And really, they're designed to facilitate research and grab, gather crucial information uh, for answering questions around efficacy, safety, and so forth. Uh, trials can be sponsored by various organizations, pharmaceutical companies, and other healthcare entities. Um, but they can really only be initiated after they've been approved by an applicable authority or committee, such as that of an institutional review board. Uh, and if you've participated in a clinical trial, maybe as a patient, uh, you'll be aware of the fact that you have to uh, give consent to actually participate in that trial or informed consent. And that's for the disclosure of your data or agreeing to the trial parameters uh, from a safety uh, perspective. Uh, and when you've uh, released consent for the clinical trial, you're then going to be working with uh, clinicians uh, and researchers working alongside those clinicians uh, and other experimenters that are going to be collecting data uh, from that clinical trial uh, to conduct research uh, and experiments. And typically, those researchers are going to come from different hospital networks uh, or networks of universities and so forth. Bruno, if you want to go next slide. Uh, so to dig into this in a little bit more detail, uh, I mentioned earlier you have this notion of an institutional review board or IRB. Uh, these IRBs can be local to the uh, participating uh, institutions uh, or entities that are facilitating the clinical trial. Uh, the IRB ultimately defines the legal parameters uh, for the trial itself and ultimately scrutinizes the trial for safety. Uh, and within the trial, you're going to have investigators uh, and different types of investigators uh, that are responsible for conducting the studies according to the study protocol and conveying to the potential participants the risk and potential benefits of actually participating uh, in the trial. Uh, and what's super important in this, as I mentioned earlier, is that any researchers or individuals collecting information from these patients uh, must obtain the full and informed consent of these individuals in order for their data to be disclosed and the experiments to take place. Uh, ultimately here, of course, regulatory bodies and regulations and processes uh, dictate the flow of these clinical trials. And regulatory bodies, such as here in the U.S., the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, ultimately set the standards to which these trials uh, have to be compliant. Uh, at any point in time, these trials can be uh, audited. And furthermore, you're going to potentially have multiple institutions that are involved in the trial. Maybe you have multiple universities or multiple entities that are interested in gathering uh, the information from the trial uh, and collecting information uh, from the participating subjects. Uh, so trials have very in-depth parameters assigned to them, uh, are time-consuming, potentially costly, uh, and ultimately have to abide uh, by a number of controls uh, within each organization and institution. Uh, so ultimately, at the end of the day, really safety is key and paramount to clinical trials, and it's really a shared responsibility between the sponsoring entity, the investigators, the institutional review boards, and in many cases, the regulatory authorities, such as the FDA, uh, for which uh, these drugs, devices, uh, and other uh, components are being sold. You can go to the next slide, Bruno. Uh, but of course, related to clinical trials, there are, really are a number of challenges that we've discovered uh, in, in working with the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, in that many clinical trials succumb to considerable time uh, and cost. Uh, and these costs, on average in the U.S. at least, range from 1.5 million to phase one clinical trials to upwards of 60 million uh, in phase three clinical trials. And oftentimes these trials span multiple years in terms of data collection uh, and so forth. Uh, and when it comes to costs, a lot of these costs are spent on antiquated IT uh, and antiquated technologies uh, that are associated with centralized systems. Uh, and these are all managed by the entities uh, individually and separate from one another. 
Uh, furthermore, data collection, of course, is key, but being able to share that data and manage that data securely uh, and in a privacy preserving fashion without compromising these uh, assets uh, are, uh, is very difficult uh, in a multi-site clinical trial. Uh, with these centralized systems, you know, unless you give these other institutions access to those systems and there's parameters that gate that access, it's very difficult to share that data. Uh, and then, of course, compliance makes this even more challenging uh, in terms of uh, adhering to the critical security controls uh, that are enforced within these systems today. You go to the next slide. Uh, other challenges uh, related to the actual conformed consenting process for patients themselves. Uh, while patients are signing a document uh, allowing for their data to be shared in the clinical trial, these documents are merely point in time documents, whether they're paper based or electronic based. Um, and oftentimes the document text is very high level and doesn't allow for the granularity that you could potentially allow for, uh, such as being able to control which data fields and which elements uh, and patient information is being shared in that trial. There's also a limited audit capability uh, within a multi-site trial. Uh, so it's difficult for multiple parties to audit consents. And like I said earlier, the system's very centralized on uh, the consents are stored in the electronic medical records uh, that are managed by those local systems. And there's a lot of incumbent technologies that have been around for quite some time, such as the research electronic data capture uh, or red cap system uh, and others. And then related to cybersecurity, of course, which is top of mind for everyone, there's limited traceability in terms of the document signature chain. Go to the next slide, Bruno. So here at UMBC, uh, we've done a lot of research into this space, uh, and we've developed blockchain technology uh, on top of the Hyperledger ecosystem. Uh, and like I said, this is based on extensive research into cl clinical trials and medical data exchange. Um, and in partnership uh, with a university-founded startup, uh, SoftThread, which is founded, uh, owned, and operated by university faculty, uh, SoftThread licenses technology from the university and patents from the university uh, to develop innovative uh, blockchain-based solutions uh, in the realm of healthcare. Go to the next slide. Uh, and so based on all of this research and working uh, jointly with IBM, Intel, uh, we've come up with a proposal for addressing the challenges highlighted uh, in clinical trials uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this approach is really rooted in a transparent trust network built on the Hyperledger Fabric and Fabric Private Chain Code technologies. And collectively, they facilitate the flow of the informed consent process and the analysis of collected data without compromising patient privacy and data integrity. Uh, this approach really gives subjects more control over the consenting process and the granularity to which they're willing to share their information and enables ultimately more secure multi-party information sharing uh, all powered by the intrinsic properties of distributed ledger technology uh, and the blockchain uh, at its core. You go to the next slide, Bruno. So the sequence flow is as such at a high level. Uh, let's, you let's say you have Tom who's with a sponsoring entity that's looking to start a new study. Uh, Tom is going to put together the requisite study materials and consent proposal templates. Uh, all of that is committed on the blockchain as separate transactions. Uh, Tom will send that to approval uh, or for approval to the IRB. Uh, the Institutional Review, Review Board will review that, uh, approve that, and of course that approval is then committed to the blockchain. Uh, and all of the participating organizations or sites uh, that are participants on this network will be notified of this, uh, and thus they can verify uh, the approval documents uh, under their own processes uh, while still working in an automated and an agile fashion. The participating subjects or patients uh, can then receive uh, digital consenting forms, which are backed and tied to uh, the blockchain itself. Uh, and instead of being point in time documents, uh, it's effectively an overlay on top of a consent document that provides information from the underlying blockchain, uh, such as the time at which they're signing and what exactly they're sharing, which gives patients more control over whether they want to allow or revoke consent at a given time. And that information can be shared to all of the uh, institutions participating in the network, uh, but in a privacy preserving way, which Bruno will talk about here shortly. Um, and uh, of course, using the intrinsic properties of the blockchain uh, behind the scenes, thus making it easier for patients to participate in the clinical trial uh, and bringing them into uh, the 21st century uh, in terms of uh, e-consents uh, in healthcare clinical trial processes. Go to the next slide.
Okay. So I want to turn it over to Bruno to talk a little bit more about the underlying technology uh, that we've been uh, working through. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks, Andrew. Um, so summarizing what uh, Andrew said, um, these clinical trials have a set of requirements. Uh, for example, um, whatever uh, framework solution you, you come up with, um, it should support um, the cooperation of multiple institutions. Uh, it should support regulatory compliance and uh, several forms of data access control and protection. Um, now, we acknowledge that uh, with the Hyperledger Fabric, you can achieve basically um, all of them since uh, Hyperledger Fabric or similar frameworks uh, would provide um, trust decentralization for uh, letting multiple institutions cooperate. Uh, it still allows to um, audit operations um, that are performed on the, um, uh, on the blockchain. And it has several, uh, it has some means for um, identity management and um, uh, data protection. Now, <clears throat> a question that comes up is um, uh, by using a framework like this, do we make any progress on, um, on privacy? Uh, for the subjects that are involved. Now, to answer this question, it's uh, um, useful to uh, look at the scenario before and after um, using this framework. Now, before the subjects used to <clears throat> give consent to the, um, to the IRB or to the uh, institutions managing the uh, trial, uh, and then they would provide the data to <clears throat> experimenters and, uh, and investigators. Uh, therefore, they would have to um, completely trust that these investigators would do the right thing and always follow the um, uh, protocol approved for the trial. Now, using a framework like uh, Fabric, uh, well, we can automate the um, uh, consent form gathering and uh, the approval of trials, but still the data would be um, sent directly to um, investigators and, uh, and experimenters. So uh, the subjects would have to fully trust them that they follow the, pro the protocols. So uh, many things have changed. We have several means for auditing data, uh, but in the end, the problem was transformed to a digital problem um, for the subject. Now, we have a solution to these privacy issues, and that involves the use of um, Fabric Private Chain Code. Now, we introduced FPC uh, last year at the Hyperledger Global Forum, so I will just give a brief overview of, um, of this framework. It essentially extends Hyperledger Fabric uh, by providing confidentiality for, um, for chain codes. So what happens is that uh, FPC wraps the fabric chain code or smart contract uh, inside an, uh, an IntelliSG enclave that takes care of protecting the confidentiality and integrity of the code and data that constitute the chain code. Now, the IntelliSG enclave is um, essentially a set of instructions uh, available on the processor that allows you to create a trusted execution environment. And the processor will take care of uh, encrypting any data that belongs to this process um, in memory, um, thereby completely isolating that from uh, any other application running on the platform. For example, uh, the operating system, the hypervisor, and uh, um, even any administrator of the platform itself. So with this mechanism, we're able to uh, isolate the chain code from the peer component and the organization that uh, um, owns uh, the spear component in Fabric. And the chain code is able to um, preserve some, um, keep some secrets also. Uh, among the secrets, we can have some cryptographic keys, which we use, for example, uh, to um, encrypt key value pairs or data that is stored uh, on the ledger and thus it would be public. Therefore, FPC still works as Fabric does, but any data that you, you will see on the ledger will be uh, stored in encrypted form. Now, a qu another question that comes up is that, okay, how can the clients communicate with this chain code, making sure that they can preserve the, pr the confidentiality of their data right when they send it to the chain code? Uh, well, the answer is pretty simple, and it's uh, by using hardware-based attestation. Uh, 
this is essentially a digital signature computed by the hardware itself, which will describe what is running inside inside an enclave. In this case, that the right chain is running in a genuine enclave. And uh, the client will be able to verify together with the hardware manufacturer that that indeed a legitimate signature and the chain code is running in a legitimate enclave. So by using this, we're able to <coughs> protect the subject data from peers, organization, and clients. And additionally, we're able to program enclaves so that the data can be released according to pre-established policies. And these policies could be implemented, for example, by uh, the institutions that um, run the trial. So by um, plugging this FPC chain code inside, inside the um, solution involving uh, blockchain, this is how the trust relationships are or would change. Um, now, uh, I've already introduced the parties involved, and uh, here you can see the trial approval chain code that's supposed to be the regular chain code on Hyperledger Fabric that um, uh, Andrew described before um, before any solution. And that's where um, uh, the blockchain will take care of gathering and recording the consent from users, as well as any approved trials. Now, with the FPC chain code in the middle, uh, then the, the subjects would not provide the data directly to investigators and experimenters, but rather to the FPC chain code itself, because it's able to um, preserve the confidentiality of the subject data. At the same time, uh, before, we had that the um, IRB of the institution would delegate, um, would give full trust to the investigator to conduct the study and the investigator would be responsible. In this case, uh, well, the investigator will keep the responsibility to run the study, but the IRB could uh, basically delegate part of the compliance to the FPC chain code to make sure that the subject data is handled according to the policies approved in the study. So what would happen in this case is that the investigator would not be able to delegate directly the experimenter to do something because the experimenter now or the investigator, they don't have access to the subject data. Instead, they all have to um, go through the FPC chain code in order to uh, perform the required approvals and uh, um, get the data for um, the experiments. So the investigator would delegate any tasks through the FPC chain code. The FPC chain code could uh, check that the trial is approved, that the, ex that the investigator gave approvals for a specific, specific experiment. And uh, if the experimenter belongs to the right institution and is using the right tools, for example, here, we have an experiment application inside another SGX enclave, then the FPC chain code would uh, um, uh, approve the release of this data just for the execution of that experiment without ever releasing the data to the experimenter and uh, only allowing the experimenter to see the final result of the, of, of the experiment itself. Okay. Uh, so we produced a, a demo um, to um, showcase this new um, uh, this new architecture, and uh, this Excuse architecture. Excuse me, Bruno. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the, is everyone seeing the same slide, or are, are you advancing slides? I am now in the demo slide. Okay. Is. Yep. So, I can see Andrew, are you seeing slide. the correct slide? Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure if there was a challenge with some people seeing the same slide, but okay. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, no, no problem. problem. Okay. So I was saying we we prepared this demo and uh, um, that has this uh, architecture. Um, again, you know the parties involved here and uh, uh, in the fabric network. Essentially, there are. Um, uh, two chain codes, the regular one that takes care of consent and trial approval, and the FPC chain code, which will um, take care of managing the policies related to uh, uh, data protection 
uh, in the release for, for that trial. Um, now, to be clear, the part related to consent, trial approval, and so the regular chain code, that belongs to uh, the solution previously described by uh, Andrew. So we build on that, uh, but this will not be part of, uh, um, of this demo. Now, we implemented all the rest, uh, and particularly these uh, data registration, experiment approval, uh, and provisioning phases. Now, it's worth noting that um, some tricks that we used, for, uh, particularly on the subject side, is, is that uh, we don't uh, send the entire data uh, to the experiment approval chain code simply because um, the data might be um, large and it wouldn't be a good idea to um, share that on the ledger, although in encrypted form, simply because there could be several parties participating and maintaining the ledger. So we would have a high degree of replication for a um, large amount of data. So instead, what we do here is we uh, let the subject um, encrypt the data and upload that to an external storage service. So we always preserve the confidentiality of the data. And instead, we register the decryption key for that data um, to the experimental approval chain code. Um, after that, the experimental will take care of, um, uh, um, of submitting new experiments for for approval. These experiments will be uh, reviewed and possibly approved by the investigator. And only at that point, um, when the right approvals um, have been uh, gathered and all the checks in the experiment approval chain could pass, then that FPC chain code will take care of provisioning the external experimentation service always through an encrypted channel to preserve the confidentiality of the subject data. Uh, and that will allow the experimenter to, um, to finally run the experiment. Of course, there is a, one more step uh, in this case, in the sense that the data sync. The experiment provisioning phase only involves decryption keys. So the experimentation service will grab the encrypted data from the storage service, decrypt that, and finally really run the experiment that would give the final result to the experimenter. So an interesting thing compared to previous approaches here is that, <clears throat> is that the subject and the ARB, they don't have to trust the investigator and experimenters to, uh, to do the right thing and uh, necessarily do audits, possibly to detect violations post facto, but rather we have real-time checks in the experiment approval service that make sure that only the right actions are performed um, in order to maintain the confidentiality. So uh, back to the demo. So this is a, a joint work with uh, several people, again, at uh, um, UMBC and SoftThread, uh, IBM, and, uh, and Intel. It was a, quite a bit undertake. And here we have a short video of the demo. Uh, the reason for the video, the reason for the video and not the live demo is because uh, as you can see, there are several parties involved and uh, um, orchestrating a demo with uh, uh, three or four parties and eight to 10 um, web services would be um, quite difficult. So here we have our UI for the demo, the different parties. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, data provider, experimenter, and investigator. The data provider in this case is our um, subject that has to provide the data for uh, the experiment. We have <clears throat> some PDFs. Those are the patient data forms. We will see those um, in detail uh, to understand what kind of um, sensitive data the patient is sending for the experiment. We have a diagnose Python function. Um, this will be our uh, data analytics that the experimenter wants to run over the subject data. I don't, sorry again.
Okay. Uh, and one last thing on the right, <clears throat> we have our console just to um, uh, log the actions of our uh, services out as they make progress. Okay, so now looking in. Uh, okay, sorry again, the play and stop doesn't work as expected, unfortunately. Okay, so the patient data um, <clears throat> is a normal PDF where the user would have to um, uh, to fill this form with his uh, own um, uh, data, like the name, birthday, and so on, and particularly would have to uh, answer some questions, and these questions will be the um, sensitive data that will be used in the um, uh, in the experiment. So it is crucial to preserve the confidentiality of that. So going to the <coughs> data provider uh, or playing the uh, as the data provider at this point, we want to uh, upload the field form, patient one. Uh, we select all the right field to uh, say how we want to share that, and we will upload it. Now, the upload, as I mentioned before, will work in three steps. Uh, the subject will take care of um, encrypting the data first. Then it will register the decryption keys with the FPC chain code. And finally, it will upload the encrypted data to the external st storage service. At this point, the data is ready. And uh, uh, the experimenter now wants to run an experiment on that data. Now, it's worth noticing here that the experiment application is already available to the experimenter. It can already run that. However, the experimenter that does not have access to the subject data. Uh, it's not authorized to have that. So what he's doing here is to is submitting a new experiment for approval, and here, the experimenter says, OK, I want to use this diagnose Python function. This is the implementation. Uh, it uses a, a PyTorch in this case, and uh, it will basically run a machine learning classifier over the subject data to, <clears throat> um, to get the probability for the patient to have uh, um, the disease stated in the form. OK, so the experiment gets submitted to the FPC chain code. And at this point, the experimenter just has to wait for approval from the investigators. In this case, three investigators who are notified of the new experiment. And they can go ahead and review that. In reviewing that, they can see it's, a, it's an experiment about presumptive diagnosis of nephritis, of renal pelvis origin. Uh, and uh, additionally, they can see uh, all the description of the experiment, including the um, code that the experimenter wants to run. After they review that and they see that everything is fine, particularly that it's not arbitrary code that, that would uh, um, break the confidentiality of the subject data, they can go ahead, verify, approve, and finally send the approval to the FPC chain code, which will record that on the blockchain. At this point, one of three investigators has approved the um, experiment. And for the policies that have been implemented, this is, uh, this is enough. So this experimenter is notified, can see that the experiment has been approved, and now is ready to uh, first, launch the instance of the experiment. So this is, uh, <clears throat> again, an application running in, a, uh, in an SGX enclave. So uh, it can be verified by means of an um, attestation, uh, hardware-based attestation by the FPC chain code. And in particular, it will have a public encryption key so that the FPC chain code can send the data, or the decryption key in this case, of the data. Um, in encrypted form directly to the experiment application. 
Bruno, sorry to interrupt, but we're almost out of time here. So uh, I think want to open it up for maybe one question, Top. See, si, I'm almost <laughs> done. Sure. Really few seconds, in the sense that the experimenter can run the experiment and grab the final decision, which is the probability of um, the subject of having the disease. So this concludes the demo. And uh, uh, yeah, we can take some questions at this point. I don't know if you can load it, Bruno. The question is, uh, how do you deal with side channel attacks? Intel and SGX enclaves have been shown to be vulnerable to those attacks. Uh, yes, correct. So for now, those, those attacks are, um, uh, are orthogonal. Um, so we, uh, we assume that there are um, other defenses possible on the platform to deal with those. Uh, in the case enclaves are compromised, uh, I just want to mention that these enclaves are um, registered on the blockchain. So people, parties involved can always verify the enclaves that are available and particularly the uh, latest security um, uh, TCB, the trusted computing base um, that, they, uh, that they used. So in the end, they have to make a trust decision whether to trust that or not, or whether to uh, ask for an upgrade. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bruno. Thank you so much uh, to all of you that participated in today's session. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out and uh, hopefully this was valuable content. Yeah, thank you everyone.